So welcome to this tutorial, uh, which is going to look at a method for creating wet maps in Houdini. Now I did a tutorial series some time ago on how to create a wet map, which used uh, a method using particles. Uh, what I'm going to do today is illustrate a different method, which uses the new solver SOP node, which is available in Houdini 12. And I'm also going to look at how you can apply wet maps to moving objects and even fractured objects. And that's a topic that's come up a couple of times in the forums. So let's start off with a very basic fluid simulation. So I'm going to lay down a box and let's make it quite big. And this is going to be the object which our fluid is going to collide with. So let's make a uh, let, let, let me leave that for the moment actually and create our fluid. So I'm going to create a sphere, move it up a bit. I think I'll make it a little bit smaller. And now with the box selected, we need to make this into a static object, like so. Uh, and then with the sphere selected, I need to go to my fluid particle fluid shelf and select fl fluid from object like so and what should happen now is our fluid should calm down and it should crash against our box like so. So the aim of course is to create a method of, of having a wet map on this box object something which shows the trails where the liquid has flowed. And there are two parts to creating a wet map. Uh, one part is to create the data on this object, the attributes on this object uh, that we need to create that wet map. And we're going to use that, uh, we're going to do that rather, as we did in the previous uh, examples that I did some time ago, we're going to do that using a point cloud. And the other thing you need in addition to that is a shader which can pick up and use your point cloud. So let's start off, in fact, by writing that shader. So what I'm going to do is start with a mantra surface shader. So let's add one of those. And let me find it in the shop context here. And I'm going to call this, say, wet shader. And let's dive inside, maximize this. Now there are two things, in general, that uh, a wet map will want to affect. Uh, you, it can affect a number of things, but the two main things that it usually affects are the color of the underlying object, where the water has been tends to be a bit darker, and secondly the specularity. Sometimes the, the liquid can leave a thin film of liquid on the surface and make it more specular. So let's start off by looking at the color and we need to find here in the mantra surface shader uh, the diffuse color input. And in fact, it's up here uh, under this diffuse uh, box. And we can see that it has a parameter here called base color. And there's this little node here which represents the parameter input. I need to double click that in order to see uh, the base color. So let me move that up here. And let me control C, control V that. And let's bring up the parameter editor. And let's call this instead wet color. Wet color. And call this wet color as well. And let me give it a default uh, that's perhaps a sort of 50% gray like so. And what I need to do is mix the wet and the dry color, that's the original base color. So the base color goes into the primary color and the wet color goes into the secondary color. And then I'm going to need a bias amount. And that's going to come from my point cloud. So I'm going to need a point cloud open. And this is going to read in my point cloud. So 
I'm going to promote this parameter, which is the texture name. That's going to be the file on disk, which is going to contain our point cloud. I can leave the position channel as P, uh, but I do need to sort out the query position. So let me do that uh, by laying down a global variables node. And in fact, I am going to output a single variable, which is the surface position. But we've got to be a bit careful here uh, because we're shading an object in this case. And by default, the surface position is going to be in something called camera space. Whereas the positions of our points are going to have been written out to disk in world space. And if we don't make the adjustment to account for that, we're going to get uh, a mess. So we need to convert using a, whoops, uh, we need to lay down a transform node and we need to feed in our position and we need to take it from the current space and convert it into world space. And then I can feed it here into the query position. The PC open node is going to open up our point cloud, compare it uh, to this position, this in incoming position, which is the point we're shading and it's going to collect up nearby points and it does that based on a search radius which I'm going to promote uh, and it also does it based on a number of points uh, and that just seems to have crashed for the moment so let me pause the video no there we are so the search radius and the number of points for some reason it seems to be taking quite a while to promote parameters there we go. OK, so this is now going to have a collection of points which are near the point that we're shading, uh, according to the search radius. Uh, and what I want to do is gather together an attribute which I'm going to use to mix between my base and my wet color. And I can call that attribute anything. Uh, I'm In this case, I'm going to assume I'm going to call it wetness. So the node that I want is a point cloud filter. So what this does is, if you like, average the value of an attribute across all the points that have been found to be near the point we're shading. So let me put in the point cloud handle here and the channel name I'm going to promote. And the channel name is, is going to be this attribute name. And then the result of that, uh, and I need to, whoops, I need to make sure that this is a float because my witness is going to be a float. The result of that I can feed in to my bias here. So when the wetness is zero, we're going to get the ordinary base color. And when the wetness is one, we're going to get the wet color. And I need to pump the result of that into this base color connector here. So the next thing is to alter the specular value. And I can do that down here. If we have a look at the surface model node, somewhere down here there will be a specular, specular intensity. There we go. So I can double click that and that will reveal our specular connector, uh, our specular parameter rather. And let's move this up to where the rest of those nodes that I've just created are. And as before, let's copy this. And let's call this spec int wet. So this is the specular intensity uh, when the object is wet. And perhaps let's give this a default value of 0.5. So we do exactly the same thing here, except that we use a, a mix node rather than a, a color mix node. So the ordinary specular intensity goes into input 1, uh, the wet intensity goes into input, input 2, and the same PC filter can mix the specularity here. And I can then take this back and connect it back down here to specular intensity. So that's uh, pretty much sorted out our shader. There's one more step, which is I need to go up to 
the shop level and alter edit the parameter interface to make it a little bit neater so with my wet shader selected I go up to the gear icon here and say edit parameter interface now you may not be able to see this entire screen on the video uh, but if we scroll down right at the bottom uh, we can see that we've got a number of new parameters here which have been created by those additional nodes that we've added so I'm going to select all of those and I'm going to right click and I'm going to put parameters in new folder and then I'm going to rename this folder wet map and let's just put the specular intensity up there point cloud texture search radius number of points channel name let's give the channel name a default of wetness uh, and then I can apply that so that should give us an extra tab for some reason that's appearing right here at the bottom with all of those parameters that are going to control the wet map. So the next step is to have a look at how to create that wetness attribute that we've been relying on in the shader. So let's go to the object network and let's have a look at that box object which is the thing that we're going to be using the wet map on. And what I want to do here is scatter some points on part of that box which is going to be the, f the, the basis of our wet map and in fact I've uh, those those handles are looking odd because I've used some transforms here at the C level I should probably have transformed my box at the object level at the geometry level here any in any case I'm going to select the top polygon the top primitive of my box and I'm going to lay down a scatter node. Now in fact I don't need this to be part of the main chain of nodes. I'm going to pull it off to one side and put the display flag back on the top import. So the scatter node is scattering 5000 points across that surface and we're going to use those points to store our wet map in the point clouds. So let me now put a null down here and I'm going to call this points out and now let's go into our fluid and this is where our main sort of work is going to be done and the first thing I'm going to do is object merge into this object the points. So notice that I used a transform here into this object that will ensure uh, that these points are the same in the same position as they were with the other object. If I if I put none you can see that it reverts back to to what it would be without these transforms that are on the box here. So it's important to have this set to into this object. So there's my points and here I've got my fluid which are also a series of points. So I'm going to use attribute transfer to mark the points here where the, this liquid is, is flowing over. So let's do that um, first of all by creating a wetness well, a couple of attributes perhaps so let's let's lay down an attribute create so I'm going to create an attribute called wetness whoops that's uh, still in caps wetness uh, but I'm also going to create another attribute uh, which I'm going to call new underscore wetness. Why do I need two attributes? Well of course the key thing about a wet map is it remembers where uh, the liquid has passed. So it continues to be wet 
even if the liquid has, has flowed away. And to achieve that you need two attributes. You need a sort of immediate attribute which tells you whether the current location has some liquid in it and then you need a sort of long-term attribute which stores whether there's ever been any fluid flowing across that part. So new wetness is going to be the immediate sort of liquid in the position that we're looking at and the wetness attribute is going to be the long-term store of whether there's ever been any fluid near that point. And we're going to need to do an attribute transfer. Uh, but if we were to do an attribute transfer here, uh, just on its own, uh, what would happen is that this would be recalculated at every frame and the wetness would disappear from areas where the fluid had flowed past. It wouldn't be persistently storing that wetness attribute. So we need to do something else. Uh, and what we need to do is use the new solver node. So the solver node uh, has a number of inputs. The special input is this first one. So I'm going to connect uh, these points that I'm importing here, which are going to form the point cloud, into that first uh, connector. The other thing I'm going to do is create an attribute on my points here, which are the fluid, and I'm going to create a uh, an attribute called new wetness. But unlike the attribute that we created here, which has a default value of zero, uh, indeed a value of zero, on this one I'm going to give all of these points a value of one. So these points are going to be wet, these are going to start off dry, if you like. And then I'm going to connect this to the second input of my solver node. So a word or two about what the solver node is doing. Uh, those of you who've seen the videos on the SOP solver, essentially what the SOP solver node does is contain, in an easy to use format, a SOP solver. If you haven't seen those videos, don't worry, because I'm going to explain what the SOP solver does. Now ordinarily, uh, when you're using nodes in the SOP context, what happens is the whole network is re-evaluated at every frame. And Houdini is able to do this very efficiently by using various caching and so on, but essentially uh, the, the attributes, the geometry here will depend just on these nodes and variables like the frame number or any animation you've put in. So what what's happening is it's just taking the frame or animation and recreating all of the geometry at every frame. What it's not doing is taking, for example, the wetness attribute on your points from the last frame and then manipulating it. It's not storing that attribute from frame to frame. So you can't rely on it knowing what the value of the wetness attribute was at the last frame. And of course that's absolutely essential if you want to create a wet map. And this is where the, the solver node comes in, uh, because the solver node starts off in the first frame and it takes this geometry which is connected here to the first connector. Uh, but after the first frame, what it does is it keeps its own internal copy of that geometry and all of the attributes, and it processes frame after frame, it reprocesses that same data. So it's not recalculating it, it's taking the data that there was at the last frame, in this case the value of the wetness attribute, and it's manipulating it and then it's putting it back. So it's able to know, if you like, what the values were at the last frame. And this is extremely useful for scenarios like this, like the wet map. So let's have a look inside the solver and we can see uh, that we've got four connectors which represent the four uh, different inputs and we have this special connector called previous frame. So this is the data from your previous frame. So in this case it's these points with the wetness attributes as they were at the previous frame. Uh, unless of course it's the first frame in which in which they, they just have the value of the first frame. So we're going to want to do our attribute transfer here. So let me do an attribute transfer. There we go. And we're going to transfer two 
these nodes that are here and we're going to transfer from the second input which is where we connected our fluid and we want to attribute transfer new wetness and on the conditions let me give myself a distance threshold say of one so it's going to be quite a narrow radius it's going to be be looking at and we might need to adjust this uh, you need to adjust this depending on the number of points you've got depending how detailed your fluid is and so on you're going to need to adjust the distance threshold so we've now got a value of new wetness and we should be able to see this if we bring up uh, a details view. There we are, we've got wetness and new wetness. And we're starting off with uh, the new wetness value being 0 throughout. throughout. So let's just uh, run through our simulation. Why is that? Uh, that's simply because it's not properly cached. So let me put the display flag back on here. Let me go to other objects. Let me make sure that my box object has the display flag on the top import. Get back into the fluid. Right. Now we should be able to play through our simulation. Wait for the liquid to hit here. And let's just stop there. So if this is working, some of these points should now have a new wetness value that is greater than zero. So let's have a look at this and have a look at the details view. And we can see there we are, there are some that now have a new wetness value that's that's greater than zero. But as I said earlier, we want this to be persistent. So we want to set the wetness value, which is the long term value, according to the new wetness and we only want to set the wetness value if the current new wetness value is larger than the wetness value. In other words, if the liquid is, is newly there. Once the liquid's disappeared, the new wetness value will be zero, but we want to maintain the wetness value of one if that's what it happens to be. So we basically need a maximum of those two. There are two ways we can achieve this. Uh, I'm going to use a VOPSOP. Uh, you could use equally well uh, a simple expression. Uh, the VOPSOP uh, is slightly faster. So I can delete everything here because I'm not going to need that. And I'm going to bring in a parameter. Uh, and I'm going to call this uh, new wetness, new wetness. and I'm going to make it invisible because we don't need it to appear. So this is going to pick up the new wetness attribute that we've got on our points. And I'm just going to control C, control V this, except I'm now going to call this wetness and make sure that the parameter name is also wetness. And then I'm simply going to lay down a max like so connect these two let me just enlarge this so we can see it better so that's going to produce the maximum value of the wetness and new wetness and then I want to write that out let me control C control V that again I want to write that back into the wetness attribute so I can ensure that this is the parameter that's being used to set attributes and I can make sure this is always being exported and we can see a connector now appears here and I can connect this through. So this should now be making sure that our wetness value is always at least, let me replay this, that where our new wetness value is 1, we should also be seeing our wetness value as 1. And for some reason that's not working. Let me go up. Maybe it hasn't cached properly. Let 
let's try uh, let me just pause the video and I'll, I'll see what's happening here well I think I've located the problem I'd misspelt new wetness here uh, so it, it was mu wetness and of course that wasn't picking up so what we should now see if I rewind this is that as the wetness value increases let's find a let's find a value where this is one we should see that the wetness value is also one so that's that's now working so this is recording now in the wetness value uh, the value of where the fluid has flowed and it's keeping that memory over time. So we're now going to need to create a point cloud uh, and I can either do this using a, an output driver in the output context here, a, a geometry rob, or another way to do it which I'll demonstrate here is to use a ROP output driver and that allows you to write geometry straight to disk. Whoops. Uh, so I'm going to put this, I've got a directory called cache. In fact I've already got some files here. For a point cloud you don't have to have the .pc extension. You can use .bgo as I'm doing here and it'll work perfectly well. So let's do that and let's uh, say render the first 50 frames. Okay, so let's do that and this will render out a point cloud disk. And that's happened more or less instantaneously because it was already cached out. And that means that I've now got my point cloud on the disk. Let me go to my wet shader and make sure it's picking up the right point cloud like so uh, and let's also make sure that my box which is the thing that's going to be getting wet is using that shader okay and let me fast forward to a point in our simulation where the liquid is spread out a bit. There we go. Uh, and then let's try rendering this and see what it looks like. And that's not terribly clear. We can see these dots where the uh, where the liquid has been. So let me change things a little bit here on our material palette. Uh, and let's make this a nice bright red color so that we can see. And the other thing I'm going to do is increase the search radius a little bit. And we can see that that's now producing a really nice wet map where the liquid has been. And as before, uh, you can adjust this search radius here. That expands, if you like, the wet map during the shading process. And the other thing you can do is uh, when you are doing the calculation using the attribute transfer in here you can change the distance threshold in fact you, you probably want a slightly lower figure than, than one and those two things can help you control uh, your wet map if you want a more detailed wet map if you, if you want something that's more precise uh, then you probably will need to increase the number of points as well as reducing those two radiuses that I was looking at a moment ago. So there we are, that's the basic method of using uh, the solver node to create a wet map. I'm now going to move on and show you how you can do this where you've got moving objects that you're seeking to, to make wet. So I've got some of this scene already set up uh, and what I've got is a cube and I've got a container here and there's a, there's a hole in the container, there's a, there's a recess in the container uh, which is going to be filled with liquid based on this object which, which neatly fits into that space. 
So let's just set, set this up. So the first thing I'm going to do is make this box into an RBD object. Uh, then I'm going to take this object here and make this into a flip fluid. Uh, and then I'm going to take this container object and I'm going to make that a static object. And then finally I'm going to add a ground plane to our scene. Uh, so what we should now see, I think, is that our box should fall down and just hit a liquid like that. Let me tweak some settings here. Uh, one thing I'm going to do is go into a... Now that's... Uh, so I'm going to go into a simulation here. And I'm just going to give the box perhaps a little bit of angular velocity, like so. And that'll make for a more interesting collision. And perhaps make it a bit more bouncy. So the bounce is here. And That looks all right now, I think. Now, one thing you'll notice is that it's not really interacting with the liquid. Uh, we can see it falls down, and the, the liquid apparently continues just as it was. Well, the reason for that is by default, when I create an RBD object, uh, it's being solved using the bullet solver. And we can see that here, because if we go onto the rigid body solver here, we can see it's set to bullet. Now, in fact, we need to use RBD if we want our uh, object to interact with the fluid. So what we should now see is that this is interacting with the fluid. We can see it, it is, in fact, interacting there. And it's also changed the dynamics a certain amount. So we now want to transfer the wetness caused by this box hitting the liquid onto the box. Well, the method is basically uh, very similar to the one we used earlier. So let me bring up a scene level view. And I need to do some extra work in the box object, which is the thing that we're, we're going to want to apply the wet map to. Uh, and let me go up here. And the thing I need to do is, again, to scatter some points onto our box. Uh, and then eventually I'm going to want to use these points as the basis of our point cloud for the wet map. But we can see we have a problem, which is our object falls down, but the points don't. The points stay where they are. So they're never actually going to reach the water. So we're going to need to ensure that these points are transformed with the object. Uh, there are several ways to, to do this, uh, one of which is to merge in. Uh, and let me first of all make sure this is grouped. And we're going to give it a group name points. And that means that I can easily delete it from our scene later on. Uh, and let's merge it in now with the with the other objects. Uh, and let's see whether that works. And do we now see those points being transformed? No, they don't get transformed. They stay where they are. And the reason for that is partly uh, that if we have a look here, if we middle click on this, we can see we've got 5,000 points, but there are no primitives. Uh, and we need these points to be collected together in a primitive. And we can do this uh, by using the add node. And the add node has, has several functions. 
But right at the end here, there's a tab called Particles, uh, which has the option to add a particle system. And what this is doing is creating a primitive, if you like, which those points are going to be attached to. So if we now middle click here, we can see that we've got 5,000 points, one primitive, and one particle system. Now don't get worried about it being a particle system. A particle system is just a type of primitive that allows you to contain a, a random group of points. Uh, let's see where this is now working. And we can see this is this is now transforming properly. Uh, in fact, if we uh, well, we'll we'll come to that later on. Actually, L let's just leave this as it is. So our points are now moving with our cube. So the next thing we need to do is essentially repeat the steps we used when the wet map was stationary. A couple of preparatory steps, though, in my box object, which is the object which we're going to apply the map to. I'm going to add a blast node, uh, and the blast node, I'm going to take that group that I set up called points, and I'm going to delete non-selected. So this is just going to leave me just with those points that are going to form the point cloud for the wet map. So I can lay down a null, like so, and I can call this points. Oh, let's do this in capitals, points out. And in fact, while we're here, let's control C, control V, this blast node. It doesn't seem to work, there we go. And instead of deleting non-selected, delete selected, and put the display flag on that, and we get a cube without the distraction of seeing all those points. And let me now go again into our fluid node and so we've got exactly the same setup that we had before and I just need to point this again at the points out node so these are our points coming in we create the wetness and new wetness attribute we create a new wetness attribute here with a value of one and then inside the SOP solver uh, we're using the attribute transfer node and the VOPSOP to set our wetness value so exactly the same as before. Let's see what we get. Uh, let me put the display flag on this. Uh, well, we can see straight away we've got a problem. And the problem is in the nature of the solver node. As you remember, I said that what it does is take uh, the geometry that's attached to this first input and, and imports it, if you like, on the first frame. But thereafter, it ignores this geometry. It's just using its internal copy uh, and its internal copy is what is eventually going to come out uh, of the node and, and go into the next stage. So these, this geometry is moving because it's being transformed according to the, the motion of the box, uh, which is a rigid body object. So this data is moving from frame to frame. The, these points are moving from frame to frame, but the solver is only looking at the first frame and it's not looking at those points as they move. So we're going to have to do something else. Now fortunately uh, one of the inputs here is input 1. So this represents the current value of uh, those, that input geometry attached to the first input. And we can see here as we're on frame 24 those are the points that are, that are transformed and these are the points that are, that are being imported from the previous frame. So ideally what we want to do is use the position information from this node but keep the attribute information from uh, these nodes here and we can in fact do that quite easily using a point sob and if I lay down a point sob uh, you'll no doubt have used the point sob quite often uh, and have noticed that it has two inputs and the two inputs allow you to transfer data from one point set of points to the next. So if I attached this geometry here to the second input, I can do something quite clever. Now note that this only works if you have exactly uh, the same number of points coming into both sides of this node. Now here these are it's exactly the same geometry in both cases. All that's changing is the position of the point. So this will work. And 
we can see that th there's this position parameter here, which is set to $tx, $ty, $tz. This basically doesn't change the position at all. It's just taking the position, coming in here, and preserving it. However, if I put $tx2, $ty2, and $tz2, what it's doing is taking the position information from the second input, and that's what these twos at the end of the variables mean. It's taking that information and it's transferring it to the points coming in here. So it's moving those points so they match the positions of these points. But it's not changing anything else. It's not changing the attributes. It's preserving the wetness attributes that we want preserved as part of this. So what we should now see uh, is let me reset this. Uh, what we should now see is this now moving like so. So I'm going to uh, hope that that's working and I'm going to render out the first 100 frames in this case. So let's render that out. So once again this is rendering the point cloud information out to disk which includes a wetness attribute for where uh, this cube has collided uh, with the liquid. So the next step is to see, uh, let's apply our wet surface material, make sure that's applied to our box. Look at the object. So there's the box. It is applied to the box, that's good. And let's have a look at the settings. And we've got it set up pretty much uh, the same as we had before. So what hopefully we'll see is this is box crashes down here, it will eventually I seem to have let me just move the display flag back onto our liquid here. Like so. So what we should see is that this falls down and that's that's not bouncing quite as much as I would like. But let's see whether the wet map is working. So if we render this, what we should see is some red around the outside. So that doesn't seem to be working for some reason. Let's try again. And that seems to be resetting the frame when I render it, so there's obviously some bug in this version of Houdini. Let's try rendering here this view. And let's move it through to... And there we are, we can see. Example for that. We can see that as it touches the liquid, it's getting wet around the areas where it touches. So that is an implementation of a wet map for a moving object. So in the final part of this tutorial let's look at how uh, we can achieve the same thing for an object which is going to fracture using Houdini's shattering tools. And this method works only for objects which you pre-fracture. Uh, you can, of course, in Houdini, dynamically fracture objects as you go along. Uh, this, this won't work as far as I know. For that method, you have to pre-fracture your objects. So let me do that. And let's start with our box. And I've got exactly the same scene file here. So let me take our box. I can get rid of this vertex node. And for this to work, I just need to disconnect these nodes for the moment. And leave ourselves just with our box. And what I'm going to use is the shatter tool here, with our box selected. And that shattered our box into several pieces. And what I want to do, uh, well, two things really. 
uh, one of which is to ensure that we are cusping our interior edges. I want it to be nice and sharp. And the other thing I need to do is create output groups so that each chunk of this cube is now going to have a different group uh, beginning with the word piece uh, attached to it. And that's essential if we're going to use the RBD fracture, Fractured Object tool here. So the next thing I need to do is to see about scattering some points on this geometry. Uh, but in fact, before we do that, uh, let's set this up as the dynamic simulation. And I'm, I'm actually going to get rid of these nodes. And if necessary, I'll, I'll recreate them later on. So in order to create this, to make this into a dynamic object, we're going to use the RBD fractured object, and that's going to create separate dynamic subjects for each of these pieces. And what we should now see is that this will fall down. It's going to work a little bit more slowly because it's calculating more bits of geometry. It's going to fall down and then it should split. It doesn't look like the impact is, is quite sufficient. So let me move my box up a bit, or in fact, let me not move it up a bit. Yes, I, I will move it up a bit, that should. And let me here in the auto dot network, let's clean that up because I suspect one of the problems we've got this box object here still, which we, which was the old box, which wasn't a fractured object, so we can clean that up. And let's have a look at this now. Maybe this will now break apart, which is what we want. Yep. So that's breaking apart. It's nicely interacting with the liquid. And what we want to do is ensure that we can apply wet maps to these fragments. So how do we go about doing that? Well, once again we need to transform we just scatter points on these on these fractured parts and we need to make sure that the points are transformed in the same way as the parts themselves. And to do that we need to look quite carefully at how those parts are being brought back into SOPs here in the box object. So what we do, what we have is here 12 primitive groups, piece 0 to 10 I think, I think there are 10 pieces, and then we take a dop import node and we can see it's set to transform input geometry and it's import by name. So what's going on here? Well, uh, this is taking the geometry that we've got coming into this node and it's using a name attribute that's attached to that geometry to decide how to transform it. So if we have a look at the details view, let's have a look up here, and we have a look at the primitives, we can see that each of them has a name, piece naught, piece one, and so on. So all of the primitives that are part of piece naught have this name attribute, piece naught. And what this node is doing is it's looking at piece naught, for example, looking at all the primitives which have a name, piece naught. It's having a look in our auto.network for the dop object that's called piece naught, and it's applying the transforms from the dop object back onto this geometry. And that's very important because anything uh, which has this name attribute set to piece naught will be transformed in the same way, even if it's not part of the original object. Now, in this case, uh, we have to be a little bit more sophisticated about how we scatter our points. Uh, so we need to use a for each SOP. So let me lay down a for each SOP. Now, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with using the for each SOP. There are some tutorials out there, uh, including one by, by me which examine how this works. Uh, but what it's essentially going to do is cycle through each group 
of primitives. So let's do that for all of the primitive groups that begin with piece. And it's then going to apply the nodes inside here to each of those separately. And then it's going to merge all the results. So if I dive in, uh, what I'm going to get is a single piece, uh, except it's going to repeat through each of the pieces. So we can see that here the moment we've got all of the primitives that make up piece 9 and nothing else. So I can scatter some points. And I'm also going to, again, turn those points into a particle system so that there's a primitive associated with the points. And I'm going to create a group again called points so that we can separate this out later. So far so good. Uh, what else do I need to do? Well I need to ensure that this the, the, this primitive has a name attribute which is the same as the part of the fractured geometry that these points are scattered on. And in fact the easiest way to achieve that is to use uh, an attribute copy. So let me lay one down. So I'm going to copy an attribute onto these points and I'm going to copy it from the original geometry. So the attribute that I'm going to transfer is called name. And if I select this now, we can see that this is also called these points, the primitive associated with these points, is also called piece 9. And the final thing uh, I need to do is merge together those points and the original geometry. So now uh, what we've got whoops, uh, are all sorts of pieces but also all sorts of points. So we've got 50,000 points. I probably don't need to scatter that quite those many points. Let's let's uh, tone down that scatter and maybe scatter a thousand points on each fractured piece. Now earlier on I wasn't bothering to delete the geometry uh, that was going in, the points rather. I was, I was feeding the points into the dynamics network and that might cause a bit of a problem. The collision algorithms in DOPS might get confused by all the points scattered on your geometry. So I'm going to demonstrate this time how you can still transform those points without actually feeding them into the to the DOP network. So I'm going to use a, a blast node and what I'm going to do is blast away all of those things that we've just added. So the points and I'm going to delete those. So that's going to delete all of those points. And this is going into the DOP import as before. So this should just give us the standard uh, dynamics simulation that we were seeing before. There we are. But what we want is for the points uh, to be transformed in the same way. So let me control C, control V, copy and paste this blast node, delete non-selected. So that's going to leave me just the points and nothing else. Uh, and let me also control C, control V, this stop import node. So this is going to do exactly the same thing to the points. It's going to transform the points with a particular name according to the corresponding DOP object. So what we should see here, if I put the display flag here, is that as this is played through, those points are moving down, and then at a certain point they will split apart as the geometry fragments. And in this case I can leave the display flag here and I can add a null and call this null points out. So uh, as I'm sure you will have already predicted all we need to do now is go into our fluid node Make sure this is still uh, collecting those points. And the solver is still taking account of moving points. 
So what we should see, let me temporarily put the flag here, is that these points move down and then move apart, which is what we want. So once again, let me put the display flag back here, but render this out. And I'm going to render the first 100 frames as before. And it looks like that's going to take a, a little while, so I'm going to pause the video while that renders out. So uh, that's rendered out, and we should now, let me just check again that we've still got the wet surface applied to our box. So let's simulate through this and have a look at these fragments here towards the end of the simulation. And let's see whether the wet map is and the same the same problem is happening. This seems to be resetting to the first frame. Uh, let's instead use this renderer here. Yep, and we can see already this is I can re-render this. We can see that already these pieces are picking up wetness from where they contact uh, the liquid. So that's a quick run through how to use the SUP solver uh, as a different method of creating wet maps. Sorry, how to use the solver node as a different method of creating wet maps and how to adjust that method to cope with moving ge geometry and with fractured geometry. I hope that's been helpful.